Nemīsi netieši to un lūdzu. It is an absolute exciting privilege to be able to introduce to you today the research agenda of the Faculty of Law for Northwest University. My name is Arnal de Plessis and I'm the Acting Director for Research at the Faculty of Law. So my excitement about the research that we do is fueled by, first of all, the era that we all live in, and second of all, by the nature of the knowledge gaps that we are all confronted with as lawyers, as scholars, but certainly also as ordinary citizens of a democratic country in transition. So at the Faculty of Law, we focus all of our research on the theme of law, justice, and sustainability. And we believe that the law in the broadest sense serves as the glue that holds together a lot of the aspects of the, of the interesting um, ecosystem of human life that we experience. So global forces and the global movement of people and things make for an interesting dynamic as far as the relationship between people, planet and prosperity is concerned. At the Faculty of Law, we focus on research that adds to the knowledge base on the relationship between humans and systems and the injustices and the reversal thereof that we need to focus attention on. We look at the relationship between economic, financial, um, religious, government and political systems and people. And we look at this at multiple scales, the global scale, the national scale, and of course, the African regional scale. So the Faculty of Law's research focus around four research projects, environmental change, finance, trade and investment, justice in practice, and vulnerable societies. Together, these projects focus on different aspects of private and public law and cover the spectrum of sustainable development. We focus from a legal perspective on economic, social, and environmental interests, and on the role and function of international, African regional, and domestic law. Our research is aligned with the Global Sustainable Development Goals as well as with the focus areas as listed in the National Development Plan of our country. As legal researchers, we also adopt different methodologies to ensure that we produce research that is relevant and that actively contributes to the protection of people's rights and interests and to the improved functioning of those very systems mentioned earlier. As of January 2019, the Faculty of Law will open the doors of its very first research chair. Its chair's focus will complement the focus of the research unit of our faculty, as it will focus on urban growth, environmental sustainability, and the law. A number of at least 10 full-time researchers will work in the chair, and together they will focus on intricate questions about the use of the law in improving matters of local government. This objective speaks to the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, but it also speaks to Goal 11 of the Sustainable Development Goals, the United Nations Urban Development Agenda, and to the um, Integrated Urban Development Framework of South Africa. The chair will be jointly funded by NetBank and the National Research Foundation. So the success of our research unit at the Faculty of Law depends on the dedication and research of different kinds of researchers. We have established researchers based as full-time academics in all three campuses of our university, early career researchers, our postgraduate fellows from around the world, as well as LLM and LLD students, our postgraduate cohort. Our postgraduate students work on extremely exciting projects, um, asking difficult questions in the fields of administrative law, labor law, estate law, constitutional law, and also legal philosophy. Some of our student researchers aspire to become academics, but many of them are fully devoted to, to the visible improvement of the practicalities and the problems around the law and justice system of South Africa in general. So the academic fraternity, civil society, and government are all key stakeholders in the research that we do. We involve these stakeholders, and we continuously build relationships also with other universities, other faculties, 
in South Africa and also beyond. We aspire to focus our attention as much on high quality scholarly output as on engaging with civil society and government. For our faculty, it is important to be published, to produce books and scholarly articles of high quality, to attend and present at conferences in other parts of Africa, also overseas. But for us, it is as important, if not more important, for our research to feed into our teaching and also to make a life in the difference, uh, make a difference in the lives of communities, especially those the closest to us, now and well into the future. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. I'm Alpitos Agbo, the Deputy Director of the School of Punjabi Studies. I'll be introducing to you the LLM and LD programs offered by the faculty. The promise of a democratic society that is founded on principles and values, such as the respect for human rights, human dignity, equality, non-racism, non-sexism, and the rule of law seem to be alive only on paper. In the past few years, with our naked eyes, we've seen how these values and principles have been defied. They've been disrespected. They've been derailed by the institutions and the persons who are supposed to uphold and enforce them. Police, bruta police, bruta po excuse me. police brutality is rife. We have social minorities being targeted. Foreign nationals have been scapegoated for the political, economic, and social blunders of the country. And corruption, that invisible enemy amongst us seems to have taken the permanent seat. The consequences have been unpalatable. The gap between the rich and the poor is widened. The fundamentals of good governance have been shaken. And worst of all, service delivery is at its worst. Beyond the borders of South Africa, there is a rise in religious fundamentalism. Human trafficking is spiking. And young girls, kids, being transformed to child soldiers, and some ending up as slaves <coughs> Excuse me, in the homes of masters who purchased them. Many have perished as they engage in migrant smuggling, looking for better conditions across Europe. Global warming is now a reality. At the postgraduate school, we offer students the opportunity to think independently and critically on how to find answers to these questions. More importantly, the LLM offerings that we give make students to think, to be able to identify and apply complex legal principles to the situations we face in our societies. So at the master levels, we offer the following programs. There is the LLM in estate law. There is the LLM in international child law. There is the LLM in international trade law. There's the LLM in labor law. There is LLM in environmental law and practice. There is the professional LLM in criminal law and procedure. And there's the LLM in public law and legal philosophy. That's for those who intend to pursue the LLM by coursework. Alternatively, you could pursue your LLM by research, which requires you to develop a full dissertation under the guidance of an academic in the faculty. <coughs> Then there's also the LLD, which is the highest qualification offered by the faculty, which is actually an opportunity for the student to develop a piece of research that leads to some substantial or original contribution to knowledge. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Almin Duplessis, and I am going to talk about things being complicated. So on 28 February 2018, our parliament passed a motion to establish an ad hoc committee to review section 25 of the constitution and other clauses if necessary. And this commission, oh, this committee must then Submit to Parliament proposed amendments to the Constitution, if applicable. So a carefully worded motion and a very carefully amended motion ask us, as the public, one question. Should Section 25 be amended? A political conundrum, an issue of justice, something that plays into every aspect of our society was reduced to one simple question, should the Constitution be amended? So I'm not here to talk about that motion. Um, instead, I would like to talk about bringing complexities back into the legal research. I want to explore the question if we as legal researchers approach controversial legal issues differently, whether we can bring in complexities that can play out in the public sphere and help to reduce polarization. Because if we as legal fraternity, the legal, we as lawyers, if our role in society is to find the truth, then surely seeing the world in a more fuller picture will lead to a fuller truth, right? So to complicate research, we need to look at the way that we ask questions. But with law being based in South Africa on an adversarial system, we often get caught up in the X versus Y narrative. Who will win? Who will lose? What is the best case for my client? Instead of what is the best outcome for both parties? In this sense, law by its very nature is polarizing and riddled with conflict. But should this be the case? Do we as legal researchers, some of you might be lawyers, not have a duty to, or a role to play in providing our clients, our students, and perhaps ambitiously so, society with ways to navigate through this duality in order to reduce, as I said, polarization. Perhaps an approach that acknowledges that law is created, followed, and enforced by humans, and that issues should therefore speak to us humans as a whole. Or, um, that things are hardly ever as simple as it seems. But of course, such an approach asks us to interrogate the way that we ask questions and the role that we as legal researchers play in either challenging or upholding the yes versus no, the X versus um, Z, or the us versus them narrative that an adversarial system brings. It looks at the psychological dimension, the political dimension, the historical dimension, and it weaves all of this into our legal research. So to bring that all back to my legal research, amend the constitution, or don't amend the constitution, but what after that? Because land reform as such is not only a question of law, right? It plays out in the space where law and politics collide, and that is the breeding ground of questions for, of justice. And these are very similar to the questions that we ask ourselves in 1993. So when we are looking at this question, we are actually assessing the very constitutional basis that our democracy is based on. We are reassessing our compromise that was reached in 1993 and that section 25 is so very symbolic of. The very protectionist side of section 25 that says protect private property rights 
and the other side that asked the state to interfere with private property rights in order to address the injustices of our past. So we are assessing social cohesion, nation building, we are looking at a sense of belonging, we are assessing the successes and failures of land reform in the past 24 years, and we are doing it by asking one simple question, should the Constitution be amended or not? And when you look at a problem from that perspective, there's very little space for the, but what after that, or the, how did we get here? And we as legal researchers need to force a different way. Of course, this requires from us as legal researchers to have a multidisciplinary approach to things. I, for instance, have to have knowledge of the history of land, of socio sociology, um, of politics, and since this is such a charged space of psychology. And this is why my research fits in so perfectly with the Justice in Practice Unit. Because in the Justice in Practice Unit, we look at how justice plays out in practice. What are the issues of justice and how does it affect society? Because where politics and law collides, that is where justice is applicable. So we don't only look at land reform, we also look at um, decolonization, children's rights, LGBTQ rights, constitutional interpretation, and so forth. And in this unit, my hope is the following. Often when you ask students, legal students, what is the answer to this legal problem? They will start with, well, it depends. And it depends is only the very start of unraveling a very complex problem that a legal problem often is. So my wish is that students, researchers that come through this unit at the end, when asked what is the solution to, you, to this legal problem, will start with, well, it's complicated. Thank you very much. Human beings and societies across the globe suffer from different forms of vulnerability. When we talk about vulnerability, we refer to the inability of human beings to be able to cope with adverse situations that are often thrust upon them by natural and uh, man-made factors. The causes of vulnerability include what is generally referred to as identity politics. And when we talk about identity politics, we refer to discrimination, which is based on several, gr several grounds. It could be based on uh, age, gender, religion, sexual orientation, race or ethnicity, and uh, socioeconomic status. The other causes of vulnerability also include corruption and the abuse of power, the abuse of human rights, disability, food, insecu food insecurity, civil conflicts, poverty, joblessness, and homelessness. My name is uh, Professor Oliver Fo. I'm the co-leader of uh, the Faculty of Law's sub-unit on uh, sub-research unit on vulnerable societies. In our project, we explore innovative legal and policy solutions that are aimed at addressing the various forms of vulnerability that I've referred to. Personally, my research centers on poverty and the quest for social justice. Poverty as a form of vulnerability and the role of local authorities in the pursuit of social justice. In my research, I investigate and apply theoretical and philosophical approaches to poverty alleviation, and I try as much as possible to draw from the variety of international and African regional standards that are applicable to, uh, applicable to this uh, discipline. Even though my research largely focuses on the role of cities, I am cognizant of the role of other role players that operate side by side with local authorities at multiple levels. By this, I refer to the judiciary, I refer to other spheres of government or levels of government, I refer to other role players such as uh, NGOs, and I try to explore 
the extent to which the interrelationship between these different role players can be used to optimize the ability of local authorities to, devo to deliver proper development. It is also common knowledge, as alluded to earlier, that uh, the effects of corruption and the misuse of public resources has a very debilitating effect on development. As a result of this, an important pillar of my research explores how good financial governance can be used as a mechanism to promote poor, poor, poor development at uh, the local level. Even though my research is principally focused on South Africa, I also draw as much as possible from developments in the global south, and uh, that really speaks to the importance of my research. The historical context and contemporary developments in the global south, South Africa, Latin America, Asia, explains that my research and the ideals which I strive to promote through my work is going to be relevant for the next foreseeable future. And that is largely because the pursuit of these ideals remains elusive. And the relevance of our program is further supported by the fact that we are able to attract a variety of students, postgraduate students at the masters, at the doctoral level, and even at the postdoctoral level from outside South Africa. We have students that are drawn from the, from the global south. We have students as far away, from, uh, as, far away as uh, Bangladesh, students from Zimbabwe, students from Lesotho, students from Tanzania, and as far away as Bolivia. I think our research will continue to be relevant for the next 50, 20 years, even though you've been, the attention has been drawn to the Sustainable Development Goals, which indicate one of the objectives is to eradicate poverty by 2030. As somebody working in this area for a very long time, I definitely think that is a far-fetched ideal which uh, will not be achieved in its entirety by 2030. Thank you. Right, okay, let's start again. First need to check my facts because I was slated to start either in the morning or the afternoon. So it's still morning, so I'll start with morning. Good morning, everyone. As you can gather, the research unit for finance, trade, and investment deals with finance, trade, and investment. However, it does not only deal with dry and boring topics. In fact, the name is just not descriptive enough. We could justify the inclusion of almost any topic under our research project since almost all aspects of law and life has a bearing on at very least law, ah, trade. Finance and investment flows directly from this and we also cover many other areas such as banking, property, contract, consumer protection, etc., etc. We strongly focus on innovation and the effects that technology and development has on society and the law. While many of the details that I just mentioned might sound rather drab and boring, just like my bank account, <laughs> I can categorically deny that research in general and in our niche area in particular is boring. Well, it could be, but then you only have yourself to blame. Of course, it does not have to be. If you are looking for a space where you can challenge the status quo, think outside the box, or write about things that other people say is not researchable, this is the place for you. We deal with topics where others fear to tread. Working with this research project, I would like to tell you about some of my own research, which also connects to that of the students that work under my supervision. After writing my doctoral dissertation on property in virtual worlds, I have continued to investigate the interaction between virtual worlds, the internet, social media, games, and digital media such as ebooks, movies, and music, amongst others. Yes, I did just say that I do research and write about games. <laughs> no, I'm not crazy. Well, maybe a little bit. 
uh, but rather call me a visionary. You see, someone has to deal with the questions concerning how property rights and ownership works in and out of virtual worlds. This includes serious virtual worlds and environments, as well as games. As such, I am currently spending some quality research time on playing Star Trek Online and Neverwinter. While in the past I've participated in, amongst others, EverQuest, World of Warcraft, and Flappy Bird. <laughs> I also write about space law. Yes, outer space. Someone has to figure out how ownership, trade, and investment needs to work in outer space. I mean, how do you legally explain the property relationships when someone mines minerals on a meteor? And who is to blame if a piece of a space station flattens your new car? Technology is developing dizzyingly fast, and legal research needs to try and keep up. This means that my research about virtual worlds, games, and digital goods now includes the interaction between the real and the virtual. I've started to investigate and write about the legal implications of artificial intelligence, augmented reality, and of course, virtual reality. Finally, I bring you back to the research project's focus, which is innovation. As you can see from my own research, we do exciting things, and the only bar to the level of innovation and excitement of your research is set by yourself. I leave you now with the following slogan. Innovative research is fun. Join us. Pursuing an NLD is a serious commitment, a commitment of about 500 pages lasting anywhere from two to six years. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alison Fidel, and I want to talk to you today about pursuing an LLD degree at the Northwest University, at the Northwest University's law faculty. Now, we've all seen memes like this. There are many perceptions out there about what an LLD or doctoral qualification entails from our friends, from our family, society, and even on occasion from our supervisors. But the very magic of an LLD degree or doctoral qualification is that it is your own unique and personal journey. You, are, you have the opportunity to do research on a topic that no one else has done before. And I started, doing, I started getting the idea for my doctorate while I was doing my master's degree. So I'm currently doing my LLD on Ubuntu as a constitutional value from a social justice perspective. Ubuntu is a concept that deals with the interdependent relationship between the individual and the community. And I'm tremendously excited about this topic as it interrogates aspects that goes right to the heart and the nature of the law. So it asks questions like, should the community de define the values of the individual? What does the individual owe the community? And what does the community owe the, the individual? Through my doctorate, I've had the opportunity to make a scholarly contribution in the field of legal ethics by interrogating how a uniquely African concept can contribute towards understanding the concept of social justice in South Africa. So even though it is a lengthy journey, I think at the end of the day, it is important to remember that pursuing and achieving an LLD is a significant achievement. It gives you the opportunity to do exciting research about the law and about something that you are passionate about. And you will have the, the opportunity to contribute towards the body of knowledge in South Africa. And I leave you with these words of Leila Kifti Akita. The pursuit of a PhD is an enduring and great adventure. I thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Angela. I am a PhD candidate at the Northwest University Faculty of Law. And today my hope is to ignite some curiosity into my research topic and to just share some of the experiences that I've had as a PhD candidate. Urbanization is the <coughs> unequivocal game changer of the 21st century. Currently, more than half of the world's population lives in cities. And it is estimated that by the year 2050, almost 80% or 75% of the world's 9.8 billion people will be living in cities. The highest urban growth is in fact taking place in the global south. And this includes cities situated in Africa. And South Africa is a country who has experienced rapid urbanization too. At the moment, 53% of the people in our country live in urban areas, and, is, and it is estimated that this number will increase to almost 80% by 2050. Cities are considered to be the most visible expression of human influence on the planet. When people think of cities, they tend to think of busy streets or of skyscrapers, and they might even think of the opportunities that cities present. It could be, for example, that they think of access to improved housing or shelter or public transport or medical services, for example. And cities are often portrayed as being beneficial to live in for those reasons. While there is an argument to be made for the benefits of urban living, it is undeniable that rapidly expanding cities, especially in developing countries, face a multitude of conflicting problems. As cities continue to sprawl and expand and as people's needs continue to grow, the demand for land and natural resources places pressures on every aspect of urban life. It also poses serious questions on the extent to which the world's current urbanization trends are sustainable for future urban life. And experts agree that the main concerns of rapid urbanization hinges on land. It hinges on the management of land and land use. And generally, land use is governed by planning laws, and those planning laws are often implemented and developed by municipalities or city authorities. So over the years, traditional planning practices have failed. And the same traditional planning practices have been replicated in South Africa and manipulated by our government in a manner that has resulted in a legacy of sprawling cities, unequal cities, and unsustainable cities. And in spite of the perils of planning, there is an international recognition that we need to plan. Cities cannot be left to themselves and they cannot continue to grow without some regulation. There has been a global movement across the world to reform planning practices, also in South Africa. In 2015, South Africa developed its new planning law framework, and this planning law framework is decidedly normative. It intends to promote balanced, environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable development while redressing the injustices of our apartheid past. So the reform in our, now, in our planning system now has questioned me or, or prompted me in my thesis to question the extent to which municipal planning law and policy actually promotes sustainable cities in our country. Because of my research and the opportunities that I have received in this law faculty and in this unit, I have been able to combine multiple fields of law and with other scientific disciplines. So I am currently, for example, not only examining South Africa's municipal planning law and policy frameworks on paper, but I'm also able to conduct interviews and integrate social science or social anthropology research methodology into my study. And I'm interviewing the municipal officials who are designing the laws and policies and who are implementing them, but I'm also interviewing people like you and I who are influenced by the way in which municipalities use their planning laws and policies to shape cities that affect our daily lives. So in a nutshell, I've had the opportunity to grow 
and to combine non-legal research methods with traditional legal research methods. I've presented research at, at national and international conferences, so I've traveled a bit, and I've really been able to grow as a scholar and, act in, and as an academic. Through this research unit and through my experience at the Faculty of Law, I am well on my way to determining whether South Africa's current municipal planning law and policy framework promotes sustainable development or reinforces urban ills, and in fulfilling my dream of, be, of pursuing a PhD in law. The father of our country once said there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. Um, what the, we, I'm going to talk about the vulnerability of children globally and the need for a legal response, which is the uh, research we are doing within the program or the LLM International Child Law. Uh, later on today I will be discussing the, the master's degree, but what we need to look at is the vulnerability of children because the first thing is why are they vulnerable? Just to give you an idea globally, is there's around 28 million children that has been forcibly displaced. Um, this will include asylum seekers, child refugees, and children that was forcibly removed from their country. One thinks of countries like uh, Sudan. Even worse is there are around 218 million children involved in child labor worldwide. This is mostly in Africa and in Asia. Another problem is more than <coughs> one million children are currently deprived of their li liberty, in other words, incarcerated globally. What is the issue in South Africa? We have around 18.6 million children, over which half 62% live below the poverty line, and 31% live in households where no adults are employed. There are also, due to mostly the HIV status in South Africa, uh, there are 3.7 million orphans in South Africa, and around 150 children believed to be living in child-headed households. In other words, where there's a household with where everyone is under the age of 18. So one would probably realize now that one needs legal protection for these children, and that's exactly what we're looking at. The research, uh, I can't really go into everything, but the research we're looking at within the program are, for example, child marriages, which is a problem, um, children being sold, um, child trafficking, Professor Achbu referred to it, child soldiers, which I would refer to a bit later on, children with disabilities, I already mentioned child labor, refugees. Also very interesting, if one looks at inter-country adoptions, one would remember um, Hollywood uh, actresses going to Malawi uh, and uh, adopting children there. So that's the issue we're also looking at and then the right to education uh, and harmful cultural practices. For example, female genital mutilation, ukutwala, and virginity testing. Interesting enough, as I was, I was not on my phone, Anal, I was just receiving a, a WhatsApp <laughs> with a student of me asking me a question. He's looking at the Chokosi custom in Ghana, 
um, regarding cultural rights where they, where if you, your um, family does something wrong within your culture or in your tribe, uh, the girl child gets sold or given to the priest. And it's still rife within Africa. So it's things like that, uh, what we're looking at. Sorry. Uh, but at the end, like I said, um, when one probably just looks at child soldiers as well, one of the things we're also <coughs> looking at is what happens now to those child children, like those child soldiers. Because it was a, it's a war crime to have child soldiers, but what happens now when they're between the ages of 15 and 18 and they're raped and they murder? Do they be, should be held accountable, for example, is, is something else we are looking at. Um, and Jen, that at the end, I was, as I was sitting, everyone had these nice pi pictures, and I thought, what am I going to do? I've got Madiba. <laughs> so yeah, that's all in all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the South African Constitutional Court said this in the fuel retailers case. It says, the economic and the social development is essential to the well-being of um, every human being. But however, the said development cannot exist or cannot subsist upon deteriorating environmental environment. Good morning, everyone. My name is John. I'm going to be talking to you about doing LLM in environmental, environmental law. Now, uh, we all have an ideal world that you all want to live in where we have the latest infrastructure, where we breathe clean air, um, there is a proper um, basic, um, basic services that are provided. I'm talking about clean water, uh, living in an environment where we have uh, favorable conditions. But is this reality though? However, unfortunately, this is not um, always reality. But we, have, um, uh, we live in a situation where we have so much development that is going on. And although it is so essential to the well-being of um, every human being, uh, it often comes with a lot of detrimental effects, not only to the environment, not only to our social, economic, and um, uh, cultural aspect of our lives. So it is for this reason, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, we need to have development that is sustainable. And one of the tools that we can use for sustainable <coughs> development or to attain sustainable development is environmental impact assessment, or the EIAs as they are commonly known. Now, the EIAs, ladies and gentlemen, they help us to uh, predict uh, the um, impacts of the proposed developmental activities and uh, see the mitigation measures that we can come up with and um, the alternatives that we, 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 can, we can come up with. Now, uh, this is my area of, of research. Now, this is why when I did my LLM, uh, I decided to write about um, the environmental impact assessment legislation in Lesotho, Swaziland, and South Africa. And you may wonder why this topic so. Um, being an international student from Lesotho, I realized that there are a lot of developmental activities that are ongoing between Lesotho and South Africa, and they date as far back as, as, the, 19, as the 1980s. I'm talking about the constructions of the dams that provide water to South Africa. But I want to ask, have you ever paused and wondered what happened to the people that lived in these areas where we, we developed dams? What happened to their social, economic, and cultural uh, um, aspects of, of their lives? What happened to the environment itself? Have you ever wondered what happened to the uh, plant species, the um, animal species that, that live there? Well, it is for this reason, ladies and gentlemen, that I decided to look into um, whether our environmental framework legislation, particularly the EI legislation in Lesotho, if it's responsive enough to address the impacts that emanate from these uh, developmental activities that are uh, ongoing. Is it good enough to regulate these activities as they go on um, existing? And it has been a very interesting journey, and I made very um, interesting discoveries in, in my research. And um, what has been the experiences and the opportunities that I had in, in doing my, my research? One of the benefits that I got doing LLM at, um, 
and environmental law at NWU. Not only did I get to sit behind the computer and do my research, but I had an opportunity to go to uh, the conferences, both international and uh, national conferences, where I had to uh, present my papers. And of course, you had an opportunity, you have an opportunity to publish your own uh, papers as a student. I had an opportunity to also lecture uh, some um, environmental law modules um, during my, my years of doing LLM. You also, I also had an opportunity to organize some of the environmental law activities, like right now we are busy organizing the Global Climate Week Change, which is an initiative that is um, uh, being observed um, uh, globally and um, by quite a lot of universities. And I'm busy organizing that together with, with my colleagues. And I'm sure you would want to uh, join me in organizing this uh, event. So ladies and gentlemen, why would you want to enroll for uh, LLM in environmental law, particularly at NWU? The reason is not only do we offer you the best in, in the faculty of law at NWU, not only do we offer you the best learning environment, but you get an opportunity to learn under the supervision of the world leading experts in our field that are recognized worldwide. I'm talking about the likes of Prof. Velemain Duplessis, my study leader, of course, and then the likes of Prof. Anel Duplessis, uh, Prof. Louis Cote, um, uh, Prof. Oliver, and so on and so on. The, the list is endless, ladies and gentlemen. And if I had an opportunity to work with these people, if I had an opportunity to rub shoulders with them, and um, benefit from their wisdom, so can you. Um, so I would invite you to come and join us and work, work with us um, in, in our faculty. And while I'm looking forward to having you as my new colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave you with this quotation uh, from the field retailers case that says, unlimited development is detrimental to the environment and the destruction of environment is detrimental to development. Promotion of development requires the protection of environment, yet the environment cannot be protected if development does not pay attention to the cost of environmental destruction. Thank you. Do you think a company or a trust can have a criminal record? I am Johanji Wright and I'm pursuing an LLM in criminal law and criminal procedure. My research is important because juristic entities play an enormous role in the economic development of South Africa. They are responsible for creating job opportunities and they encourage investments from both abroad and local. That said, Often these juristic entities do not conform with the law. The, they, this gives rise to scandals and disasters such as the recent Listeriosis outbreak. Corporate criminal liability was developed within the criminal law as a means to address this issue. Corporate criminal liability is the notion that juristic entities must be held accountable for certain illegal acts by the imposition of criminal penalties. Another interesting question in this field is how far corporate criminal liability stretches. Can a company be, he can a company be held criminally liable for a crime such as rape or murder? This subject has been amongst huge debate in academics and no straight yes or no answer has been reached thus far. This, in a nutshell, is what my research entails in pursuing an LLM in criminal law and criminal procedure. My experience with research thus far has been it's amazing, difficult, and confusing at times because, as Van von Braun once said, research is something that you do when you don't know what you are do doing. <laughs> so, research takes it really, I'm not going to lie, it takes dedication, it takes self-discipline and sacrifice. But all that said, I wouldn't do anything else with my time other than research. It's an amazing discovery. It's a journey that you walk and you learn things about yourself you didn't know that you had, like standing in front of this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I wouldn't do it anywhere else other than at the NWU as we have an amazing supporting structure. We have professors that really go the extra length for us. And yo, study at LLM, don't be average, be awesome. In 2013, Mr. Castro wanted to draft a will while in hospital, but neither he nor his brother had pen and paper. They decided to make use of their Samsung tablet, specifically the S Note application. By using stylus, they drafted the will. It was signed by witnesses, password protected, and saved on the tablet. Do you think that electronic document on the tablet was a valid will? It was questions like these and interesting case law that persuaded me to pursue an LLM in estate law. I've always wanted a career in the academics, and by obtaining an LLM, it's a stepping stone in the right direction. But you're not limited to a career in the academics. The value of this LLM is in the practical and the theoretical skills you obtain in subjects such as, such as tax, estate planning, financial planning, and private law subjects which will open doors for you in the private and in the public sector. My experience was an enriching and rewarding experience. First of all, doing a structured LLM, you immediately have a support group of people going through the exact same experiences as yourself. And believe me, you're going to need those people and rely on them during this experience. Further, I had the opportunity to present at a conference. And although it is intimidating presenting your research in front of academics, some of them you're quoting and using as sources, and practitioners with years of experience, it is also inspiring to be amongst people doing what you're aspiring to do. And I further got the opportunity to be a temporary lecturer at the law faculty. Now to turn and deal a bit with what my research was about. You might have been able to derive from my introduction that it had something to do with wills. My specific focus was on the status of the legal status of electronic wills in South Africa in comparison to those in USA, Australia, and Canada. That electronic document on the tablet was declared a valid will in the state of Ohio. The markings used by stylus and the software of the Samsung was concluded to be writing by the court. And the signature, a graphical image of Mr. Castro's signature, was valid. In Australia last year, an unsent text message was declared as a valid will. And a few years ago, a testator drafted his will by using the notes application on an iPhone, and the court accepted that. Nevada has specific legislation dealing with electronic wills. And this is just one example of interesting research questions in the field of estate law. Have you ever considered what would happen to your Facebook account, Twitter, Instagram when you pass away? Should an estate planner make provision for these assets? What about Bitcoin? Are you liable for income tax, capital gains tax? If you have a life insurance policy and you refuse medical treatment, but you would have had a 60% survival rate if you underwent the treatment, is your life insurance policy liable to pay out? So please come and join us in exploring this rich and diverse research field in the LLM estate law.
research is commonly known for its ability to broaden one's knowledge. However, in my personal experience, it also goes beyond that. It is one tool that enables you to reach your maximum capacity of independent thinking. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hepso Taole, an LLM student in public law and legal philosophy. Now, I believe conducting research gives birth to analysts. When you're a researcher, you analyze the views and theories of different authors with an intention to make logical reasoning out of it to create your own theory. And that requires you to be more and that requires you to be more engaged and philosophical in your analysis. As a result, you become this one individual who's tolerant, who has tolerance for obstacles and has better understanding that there's a, there's a solution to every problem. Because I will admit, research is not easy. If anything, it's frustrating at times when you get to realize that there's not much materials on the topic you're conducting or you're just too lazy to go through all the reading materials, or maybe <laughs> there's not enough time to get it done. But trust me, we all go through that at one point. And that's the whole point. Research is supposed to be challenging, because if it was easy, we'd all be professors in here. <laughs> but above all, the best part about research is contributing new knowledge, to the contributing new knowledge to the legal world, joining the legal minds of philosophers and becoming the best that you can be. And that will also help you to boost your self-confidence and put you in a much better position to educate others who also aspire to be researchers. Now to talk a little bit about my topic, my research is titled The Analysis of Rape as Prosecuted by the UN Ad Hoc Tribunals. It is after the atrocities that happened in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda that led up to the establishment of these tribunals, being the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. It is, it is in the statute that rape was not defined, nowhere was rape defined, and rape was also categorized under broader categories of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Now this brings a question of how rape was prosecuted by these um, tribunals. It was left up to the courts to define rape. Now my research seeks to investigate the material and mental elements of rape as prosecuted by these tribunals. Now like I said, research is not easy. It can be challenging, but I don't want it to be easy because easy things do not produce greatness. It might be challenging, but it's still fun. So I hope you come and join us, those who are intending to pursue their career in research. Thank you so much. Research, where agony leads to great euphoria. <laughs> now, my name is Amkhalan Donald Tlatoso. I'm a master's student in public law and legal philosophy. I'm basically here to tell you why I love research. That's why the next slide is why I love research. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, as a researcher, you get to broaden your own knowledge, first of all, by indulging in your, you know, those senses, your academic and intellectual cravings, 
you get to feed those cravings by becoming a researcher. Secondly, you get to engage other scholars. As my previous speakers have said, you get to, we are all scholars here, right? I have a right equally to engage Prof Agbo or Prof Duplicis in an academic manner in that platform. That's what, the, that's what research gives you all in all. And lastly, you get to make an impact. You get to change lives. You get to make your own contributions. Now, from a young age, I was more into drug regulations and drug abuse prevention. My last year's research was on that very first thing. Did you know the Medical Innovation Bill, as introduced in 2014 by Dr. Ambrosini in Parliament? Now, that bill specifically dealt with using cannabis in medical innovation, wherever the traditional methods of treatment failures, we can then use cannabis as an alternative treatment. Now, this year, I'm more focused on using cannabis, utilize, ut utilizing cannabis for medicinal, economic, and religious benefits. Now, I'll be drawing lessons from countries such as Canada, states in the US such as the Washington DC, and other states uh, such as the Netherlands and others. Now, did you know that as of last year, August, more than 300 applications were made to the Medi Medicines Control Council for Patients, actually, there was, for you to be able to use marijuana in South Africa for medicinal purposes, you must apply to the Medicines Control Council. Now, only 300 or plus minus 300 applications were made, but out of those 300, only three were approved, meaning at this stage and at this time, only three people in the Republic of South Africa are allowed to use cannabis for medicinal purposes. Now, if we look at the judgment gave, given by the Western Cape High Court last year on the 31st of March, that judgment on its own allows an individual, an adult individual to use cannabis as long as you are in your own private dwelling and the likes. So my research is more focused on now extending the use of cannabis to recreational use and even religious use, and also making sure that we benefit our economy in the same time. Now, my final words. My philosophy, is it agony or euphoria? I believe research is an agonizing process. It's a painful process. Sometimes you stay awake at night wondering, must I go to that computer lab? Must I do this? But you really know that you need to do that. Now, if it's easy, my philosophy is that it's, you are probably doing it wrong or your topic has already been exhausted. <laughs> now, at the end of the day, the pain that comes with the research is the reason why some of us end up loving the research. Because once you look at your final project and you, you see the, the, the energy you've put in there, the time spent and, you know, the emotions, honestly, research gives me mixed emotions. Sometimes you are happy, sometimes you are sad. <laughs> but at the end, when you have your final product and it's a masterpiece, knowing that you're about to make your own contribution, you're, you're about to impart knowledge, that's why for me that feeling of euphoria kicks in. You know, you become happy because you know, hey, throughout the year I was not sleeping. <laughs> you know, sometimes we even end up eating with your laptop. <laughs> at the dinner table. So that's, that's, that's research basically for you. It's not, it's not an easy process, but it's a fun process. It's an enjoyable process. Thank you for living the best for life. <laughs>